Well, hello, Bridge Church, and Merry, Merry Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. We're not quite to the big day, but we're almost there. So we are so, so excited that you have joined us this evening for our Christmas Eve service. It's a great time. It's a good place to be. It's warm at least. Kind of in here. Yes, it is much warmer in here than it is out there. There are a lot of people, in case you haven't been able to notice, in the lobby, warming it up. It's a great time. We've got cookies over here. We've got people talking. We've got people just doing their thing, getting ready for Christmas, and it's going to be a good time. So wherever you are tuning in from, if it is here locally or maybe across the world, we are so glad that you could join us today. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great night. So Christmas, let's talk about it. What? i got to ask you right off the bat. Christmas um, traditions. What is something that you guys do every year? Christmas tradition. Give me the best one you got. Not the third best, not the second best. Give me the best. The best new favorite tradition that my family has. We started about two years ago. Um, and then Christmas Day, after we open presents, which my kids are older, um, we spend the day in our pajamas and order a bunch a of must. Chinese food. Chinese food. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah, it's, it's mom's favorite new tradition because I don't cook. That's and awesome. Do, right? No dirty Chill. dishes with that. Yeah, Chinese. Yeah. Th that is amazing. Well, um, I'll give you mine, right, if, if I may. If I may. So Christmas Day, I'm going to set the scene here. You wake up, uh, not to an alarm, of course, definitely not to an alarm. We open presents, and then we turn on the greatest Christmas movie of all time, not even arguably. It, it's not even arguable. Elf? It's Not Elf. That's second ba favorite, but in our household... National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I got get, I get down with my man, uh, Clark Griswold, and uh, we build some gingerbread houses. And every year, we, we post them on some type of social media, and we judge whose is the best. I always lose. Lillian is amazing. She does better than me. But this year, I'm bringing my A game. I am bringing my A game this year, and I think I'm going to take home the gold this year. Yeah. I don't know. 
every year it's like, it's a gum it's a gumball drop that like when I place it on the whole thing usually collapses and then I give up. But this year I feel good about it. I think you can do it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I well, think people would rather hear from some kids besides us. How I 100 percent yeah. agree. So I we have some special guests, I do believe. A little boy and a girl that I'm certain are on Santa's good list. Do you guys want to come over? Come, come on, on over, over, guys. Listen, if yeah. you're watching us live, hit the come like on. button. Give it up for Jensen okay, and Miss Addie Bing. Yeah. How are you guys? Are you excited for Christmas? Yeah. Are you excited for Christmas, Jensen? Yes. What is your favorite part of Christmas? Everything. Everything. What about you, Miss Addie? What's your favorite part of Christmas? Everything. Everything. Okay. Is there anything that you don't like about Christmas? Is it, I think when you get up in the morning, do you get to go open your presents right away? <laughs> That is, that is an excellent answer. I don't either, buddy. Let me. Did you ask Santa for anything? Yeah. What did you ask for? I asked for a robot that would walk to me whenever I wanted it to. Oh, I love it. How about you, Miss Addie? What did you ask for? Soggy doggy. I hope you get it. Merry Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas, guys. Well, listen, we just want to say thank you guys so much again for joining us. We are going to go ahead and kick it inside where we have a video for you guys to watch. Again, if you weren't able to make it here in person, we want to say Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful, wonderful year. And for all of our people in the lobby, we want to say Merry Christmas. Tune in and watch this video.
for you, pa rum pum 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 on my drum. Christmas Eve at Bridge Church. Are you glad to be here? Hey, we are so glad that you have joined us. Of all the places you could be, including just somewhere nestled close to somewhere or someone warm, we're glad that you are here this evening. And we're going to continue tonight. We're going to sing some carols. We're going to read the Christmas story with the kids gathered around. I'm going to give a short, short, short word tonight. We'll take communion. We'll light candles. It's going to be an amazing night together. But I wonder if you could just take 30 seconds, say hello to someone right around you, say Merry Christmas, you're glad they came, and we're going to sing some carols together.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, you all can be seated. And uh, now we want to take a couple minutes. It's one of my highlight moments of this service, which is really a highlight service for us all year. Uh, we're going to bring the kiddos up on stage for all that parents you're comfortable doing that. Uh, Miss Heather's going to kind of be standing here. We'll have some other folks that help them get on the stage. We're going to read the Christmas story. So, Mr. Kirby, you can make your way on up. And let's just go ahead and you can send your kiddos on up in a moment of Christmas organized chaos. A great picture moment. In our brains, we'll be looking around and seeing the best dressed kids. Oh, my, my daughter has a sucker. There must have been pandering involved. Hey, kiddos, you can circle around Mr. Kirby this way. Hey, kids. say and give them my power deep down in their hearts to fight what is bad to make a new start and live in this world just like I first planned and turn what is sad into glad again so a woman called Mary just minding her business was asked to be part of the very first Christmas by an angel called Gabriel shiny and bright who showed up one day and gave her a fright. No need to be scared, the angel explained. I come here with good news, simple and plain. You'll give birth to God's baby, it's all in his plan, to turn what is sad into glad again. Then Mary and Joseph, her husband, went down to be counted by Caesar in Bethlehem town. With no empty rooms left to rent for their stay, they stopped in a place where the animals lay. And there in the hay, she gave birth to God's son and cradled and cuddled her small special one who would grow up to do all the things God had planned and turn what was sad into glad again. Some shepherds were watching their sheep down the way when an angel appeared like a firework display and shocked all the shepherds and shook up their sheep and made sure no one would get a night's sleep. Go to Bethlehem now, the bright angel said. See the babe in the manger, hay under his head. He's amazing, he's special. For only he can turn what is sad into glad again. So that's why we have Christmas and welcome the day and sing and eat turkey and put on a play and dress up like angels and get lots of toys.
But it's not because, not just because of that sweet baby boy. It's because of the man he grew up to be who changed the, wor the whole world and can change you and me to live and to love just like God always planned and turn what is sad into glad again. Thank you. Thank you, guys. The kiddos, you all can begin to head back down. Parents, you feel free to come forward if you feel the need. I hope my, this one. You're good. <laughs> no. Big jump. That's awesome. It, that's one of my favorite moments. You, uh, you love that poem that we, yeah, that, that's amazing. Hey, um, Merry Christmas. Are, are you all feeling the joy? Are you feeling the stress? Are you feeling, feeling the season? You're trying to feel something as cold as it's been. And I lost a wheel on the way over here. So if this comes crashing, um, I'm going to do my best to hang this way. Hey, um, just to keep things light and fun for just a second, you know how Jimmy Fallon, Joseph to the rescue. I, thank you, sir. Let's, nailed it. Let's give Joseph, literally. Is there irony that Joseph came to, that was almost like a planned Christmas Pun. Speaking of Christmas puns, you know how Jimmy Fallon does these amazing hashtag challenges around Christmas? Is it okay if I share with you a, fun, a couple of funny ones that he did in the last couple of years? Um, one is called Decoration Disasters. So this is like crowdsourced funny memories from for, throughout Christmas. And someone tweeted at him a couple of years ago saying that one year I ran out of Christmas wrapping paper and only had ones that said happy birthday on it. So I just wrote Jesus underneath. I like that one. Um, another, another poor, this one's kind of sad. My parents always buy custom ornaments with me and my boyfriend's names on them. Now every year a tree is a monument to all my failed relationships. Um, here's another, a different hashtag, worst gift ever. Um, my grandma once wrapped 24 pairs of socks individually. By the 20th pair, my little brother was in tears. Um, one more, one more. When I turned six, my parents forgot that I asked them for a baby doll, so they told me it was kidnapped and they gave me a ransom note. I thought those were good. You know, whether it's decoration disasters or bad presents or those awkward parent Christmas fails, um, do you ever ask yourself this question? It's maybe ironic, but the question is this. Why do we still bother with Christmas? Why do we bother with this thing? Why do we come to a room when you're still like stressing over getting things ready? Why do we show up at nights like this and light candles and sing these songs? And let's be honest, can we keep it real? We sang some lyrics there a minute ago that you're like, yes, and I have no idea what that meant all at the same time, but we do it. Why do we bother with Christmas? It makes sense economically, it's good. It's someone out there thought, you know what would be good for the economy? Let's create like a multi-month window where everyone goes and spends money. That'll probably be good for the economy. Um, why bother with Christmas? You know, it's good for like societal rhythm. At the end of the year, we all just need to hit the pause button and reflect. That's good. That's good. Why bother with Christmas? That makes sense. There's even like a, a social cohesion to it. Like, why bother with Christmas? Because maybe tonight, maybe in this room, don't look at them if this is true for you, um, we put on a good face with people that maybe we struggle to get along with the rest of the year, and we live into the nostalgia, and we do the thing, and it feels good. Why bother with Christmas? And all of that makes sense to me. But if I'm honest with you, some of you may have walked in here, and you're like, but why do we still bother with the Christian Christmas? Why do we still do the Christian Christmas? That story we just read, love it. But can we break it down from it? That's a little crazy, right? This Christmas story is a little crazy. An angel appears to a virgin teenage girl and says, hey, you're going to get pregnant, but don't worry, it's from God. 
Uh, and then to the guy she's going to marry, she's like, hey, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, it's from God. So again, you don't have to worry. And somehow, Joseph, this guy is like, okay, I believe you, so we'll just raise this kid and make it work the best that we can. Then there's this megalomaniac king who's coming to kill and destroy all the babies so to get at this baby. So an angel, again, appears to them. is like, y'all get to get out of here. And then some wise men follow a star and show up. Then some shepherds who saw angels in a field show up. And then the baby flees. And we get a couple highlight real moments. But for basically 30 years, we have no idea where this baby went, what this baby did and what his life was like. Merry Christmas. Why do we still bother with that story? One of my favorite authors, um, this, her name is Fleming Rutledge. She, she says this, and I think it starts to come together in this statement. She says that the entire thrust of this season at the end of the year is designed to bring us face to face with reality. Reality about sin and death, reality about the human race, reality about God. Something ultimate entered our world, something or someone that calls us to attention, and calls us out of the daily preoccupations and our routine points of view. Why do we still bother with Christmas? Because something ultimate has happened. And year after year, we are invited to orient our life and our perspective and our heart and our traditions and our candles and our songs to come face to face with that reality. Something ultimate has happened in my life and something ultimate has happened in many of your lives as well. And that something ultimate lovingly confronts us and it confounds us and it comforts us and it challenges us and it changes us. Why do we still bother with Christmas? Why do we still bother with this story? Here's my answer to that question. Because you and I need something or someone that makes sense of things. When nothing seems to make sense, we need something that makes sense of things. You need something that holds things together. You need a bigger story to host and to give meaning and purpose to your story. You need hope. You need a reason to keep going through what you're going through. Every year, some videos around this time of year start circulating, like in a moment we had an opportunity for, uh, where kiddos are brought up on stage, maybe they sing a song. And there's always that one kid, maybe two kids, who realize they're the star of the show. You've seen these videos. Any of your kids that, Mariah, uh, Mariah Begum, um, last week? Any of your kids out there just living their best life on stage? And I came across this video. I'm going to go ahead and let them play on um, this past week that was making its rounds. I'll let you all see this. And in this story, if you can see the context here, this little girl is up on stage and she's lost. She's wondering where her parents are. She's anxious. She's overstimulated. And all of a sudden she looks out. She finds her parents and she immediately is overjoyed. She can't stop looking. She can't quit looking. She can't quit waving. She's found her people. The point of this, thank you brightly for your shameless plug, something inside of this little girl, right there in the noise, the confusion, the overstimulation, was searching for the people that made things make sense for her. She was searching for her parents, for the people who give her the deepest and the most profound sense of belonging and love and acceptance and safety. And let's be honest, that need never goes away for us. How many of us, I wonder right now, are coming into Christmas on some sort of desperate search for someone or something to make life and all of its beauty and all of its struggles make sense. Walking into this room tonight, watching via the internet tonight, my assumption is that in every single one of your lives, not someone else's, your life, think about you for a moment, some sort of personal mashup of all that life can throw at you is happening. The good, the bad, the beauty, the pain, the joy and grief, 
clarity and confusion, confidence and insecurity, health and sickness, reconciliation and divorce. It is all happening. It's happening in your thoughts, in your emotions, in your relationships. It's present with you at work. It's present with you at the gym. It's present with you in your morning commute and in those hopeful non-traffic-free commutes home from Charleston as we've had recently. Some days it seems like it's in the rearview mirror, these struggles, and some days they feel so close you can reach out and touch it. And if that's you tonight, I want you to know that you walked into a room full of fellow travelers, fellow pilgrims, fellow sojourners, fellow people who are clawing to fight this battle, to live in the tension of joy and pain, struggle and reality checks, health and sickness, clarity and confusion, joy and depression. Welcome to the fam. There is an interesting moment in the life of Mary, Jesus' mom, where she had to confront this reality of her own struggle between beauty and pain, between hope and fear. In the Gospel of Luke, in Luke's account, his narrative, we pick up the scene on the day that Jesus is eight days old. And just to humanize this all too familiar story, remember, Mary is still a brand new mom, like eight days into this thing. And she's young, and she's not in middle class 2022 West Virginia or modern day America. Do any of you remember those early days, like you're eight days into parenthood, or is it too like traumatic that you've tabled it and it's somewhere over that? I mean, think about it, Mary, she is not sleeping. She's stressed out. She's worried. She hasn't showered for three days and she just used the last of her dry shampoo. I thought that would get more. Like, I know what dry shampoo is. I just want, you know, I'm, I'm here for the people, Eliza. Um, and Joseph, <laughs> Joseph, he's just like standing there to the side like all first-time dads. Like, you're doing good, honey. Um, tell me what I can do. Um, what, how can I, I? He's struggling. He's trying to adjust. And here's Mary. In the midst of the struggle, she's also finding some of the deepest fulfillment and contentment and joy she's ever experienced looking down in these eyes that are looking back up at her. And so as was the custom, on that eighth day, Mary and Joseph, they take Jesus to, this, to the temple, and an old man named Simeon is there. Luke describes him as devout and filled with the Spirit, and when he sees this child, eight-day-old baby Jesus, he knows who this is. He knows he's the fulfillment of some stories he's been wrestling with. He knows that he is the person that God gave him a promise that he would see this coming Messiah. And so Simeon takes this baby in his arms, and he blesses him. A beautiful and a hopeful blessing. But then things change. His final words are a bit chilly, and they're only for Mary, again, a teenage mom eight days into the brutal journey called parenthood. And instead of offering a word of encouragement or like, good job, you made it, you're here, you're not late, you did it. He says to her about this baby, that in her future, because of this beautiful baby that right now only holds hope and love and romantic wishes of a future He says to her, kind of rudely, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Imagine telling that to a first-time mom eight days into the... And a sword at the hands of this baby will pierce your soul too. She had to be wondering what that meant. Fast forward through Jesus' life, the days and the years they roll on. And I imagine that in the back of her mind as Jesus is growing up, Mary is holding on to these words... Wondering if they were real, and if so, was this the day they come true? I imagine she carried some fear, the same way any of us as parents live, balancing the joy of watching our kids grow up with the worry of what they might face in their journey that we know we can't actually stop from happening no matter how hard we try. And of course, you know Jesus' story. You know that his human life ended just as Jesus knew it would, but not as any loving mother would hope for it to end. And on that fateful day, as Jesus was hanging what became his ultimate moment on earth prior to the resurrection, he's hanging on the cross. Mary, watching just feet away, witnessed as the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear and blood flowed from his side. And it's in this precise moment that Mary knows about that sword that pierces. She understood Simeon's words now. 
Today, knowing what we know, we look at the cross maybe as a picture of love, of beauty, of self-sacrifice. For some of us, it adorns our necks as a piece of jewelry or as a piece of art hanging from our walls. But I wonder in that moment, wrestling with that blessing and that warning from some 30 years prior, what did Mary think about the cross? Did she see only pain and death, or did she see beauty and redemption? Another author says this. He says that sometimes one feels that there is a discord between the cross and beauty, but there really cannot be, for God is found best through those two doorways. And so as we wrap up in just a moment, we will take communion, and we will sing to remind ourselves of the light that breaks in through all the darkness that we experience. I want you to imagine with me two doorways. And I want you to picture these doorways, and one has one doorway full of beauty and love and everything that's good in your life. And another doorway that is just full of pain and struggle and difficulty and tragedy and unexpected scenarios you never thought you'd walk through. Because the reality is each of us exists with this struggle. None of us, in our search to make sense of things, go without one or the other. And the invitation to you is this. What if this Christmas you began to live into that deeper reality that in Jesus' humble coming as a baby at Christmas, and then ultimately through his life and his death and his resurrection, that you have someone who is making sense of everything, making sense of both doors, that in the cross is the perfect fulfillment that holds in perfect tension and paradox and love those two things together, who makes sense of your joy and your sorrow, of your satisfaction, your regret, of your search to belong, of your quest for an identity. Frank Laubach wrote these words, and he continued that same thought. He said that God is found best through these two doorways. Think about that. Pain and love, beauty and struggle. God is found best through those two doors. The gray blue rolling water tinged with white caps, hemmed with distant green hills, crowned with baby blue skies, reveal God's love of beauty. God is so lavish with his paintbrush in the tropics. He is lavish everywhere. If only one has eyes to see him at work kind of like Simeon did when no one else saw it. But there is in the universe a higher kind of beauty than a pretty face or even a soul that sings for joy. It is the beauty of sacrifice, of giving up for others, of suffering for others. The beauty of sacrifice is the final word of beauty. Beauty and pain, two doorways that come together for you in the cross. So why do we bother with Christmas? And why the Christian version of Christmas with all these crazy, crazy, crazy details? Why light the candles? Why sing the carols? Why the traditions? Why gather on Christmas Eve when we know you're hungry and everything's not ready? Because it's a time to remind ourselves that there is a greater reality, that something ultimate has happened and it is happening, that Jesus stepped into our world and through his life, through his death and through his resurrection, he and he alone holds together in perfect love your experiences of pain and beauty and health and sickness and everything in between. And I don't know what your experience of these moments or of what church or pastors and religion has been, but let me unequivocally tell you today that the story of religion is about man searching for God. But the story of Jesus and Christmas is about a God stepping into time and space and searching for you and saying, you, yes, you, you're worth it. Let this Christmas and this night, and as we partake of communion together tonight, let it remind you that Jesus thought you were worth showing up for. That through your tears and through your pain and through your struggle to trust God and to let go and to quit trying to control everything, that God has come and he's with you. And whether your life is filled with beauty and joy and things are going nicely or your life is a mess 
and it's confusing and it's hurtful or you're filled with shame or regret, Jesus is here to give you impossible hope. And he's here to bring light to your darkness and peace to your fear and comfort to your mourning and clarity to help you to embrace these two doors and see in both of them beauty, love, and pain and struggle that there is no greater place to experience the love of God than right in that spot. Why bother with Christmas? Because it reminds us that God's love and because of God's power, you and I have nothing to prove. You have nothing you can do but to step through these doors and embrace the God who is with you in every moment of your life. And so for all the Jesus followers in the room, let this be just a deep, 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 deep reminder of why bother with this Christmas thing? Why put your faith and why keep striving to work out your life in relationship to him? And for those of you that are like, I'm in the room and I'm appeasing some people and I'm taking some words seriously and some not like, can I just say, I know this is a crazy story. I'm glad you're in the room. And I pray that you sense a little bit of God saying, I'm with you in those doors the doors that you thought you shut and that he won't break through and you're disqualified from and religion has told you you're bad and God just says, I know who you are. That's why I came. So wherever you are in a search for belonging and identity and worth and love and community, why bother with Christmas? Because Jesus came to show you he loved you. And so I wanna invite those on our team that are gonna help us with communion to come forward and we're gonna kick it pre-COVID, all right? Um, we're we're going to invite you to come out of your chairs today and to come forward. And members of our team will be up front and you can take a wafer and dip it in the water or in the juice. Um, if you prefer like, ooh, that's icky. We have some COVID friendly things just to the side. You can grab no shame or regret there. But I want to invite you to stand at this time. And I want to pray for those of us in the room, those of us online, then I'm going to invite you forward. But let me pray first. So Father, on this Christmas, why do we bother with this? We bother because you bothered in your life to care about us and to be with us. God, Emmanuel, our greatest need our greatest hope lies right in that tension that you fulfilled and you took for yourself on the cross and through your resurrection. God, I pray that you will meet us tonight where we are and as we are, that whatever ounce of shame or regret or tradition or nostalgia, whoever we are, may we bring ourselves fully into this moment just to meet you here. In your name we pray, amen. So basically there are four stations, there are four aisles, and so you can move your way out of your seats, you can come forward and then head back to your seats. I invite you forward. Away in the manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus Lay down his sweet head The stars in the sky Look down where he lay The little Lord Jesus Asleep on the hay crying he makes I love the Lord Jesus look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is I ask thee to 
no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the team's going to lead us in a, an original version arrangement of Silent Night. Um, they released it today, so you can feel free to check that out. But there's a line in this song, again, why bother with Christmas? There's something in this line that we're about to sing. It says, all is calm, all is bright. All is calm, all is bright. You may hear that and again. It sounds a little crazy because it's not calm for you, and it's not very bright. Why bother with Christmas? Because when we hold these candles up, we're not participating just in a religious duty, but we're reminding ourselves that in John chapter 1, as he said, the Word became flesh, and a light came, and it pierced the darkness. Later in John's narrative, it says, don't fear, like you're going to have troubles, but fear not, you're going to have some things. Fear not, because I've overcome the world. That's kind of how light works. There's no power, there's no darkness that light cannot overcome. And so as they sing, I'm going to come down, I'm going to light some candles on the front row, and you just start working this candle backwards. And the whole idea here is to again remind our hearts that there is a light, that is Jesus. Why bother with Christmas? Because when things aren't calm, he makes us calm. And he walks into our anxious presence and he becomes like the, like the God who calms the storm. And he has power and love to meet us there. And so I'm gonna begin, I'm gonna come down, begin to light the candle, the team's gonna lead us. So you stand and you sing and you enjoy this moment together.
Father, we thank you that in the midst of our darkness and our struggle, you meet us as we are. Thank you for being this ever-present light in the midst of our joy and our pain and our struggle. God, I pray that you help us to see you as, as the one who loves us and lifts us up, the one who confounds us and confronts us and changes us and challenges us. God, I pray that you'll be with each person in this room today as they go from here to celebrate Christmas with friends and family in a way that they see you and they find hope into a new year. In your name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. You can blow out your candles. Uh, we'll have bins by the doors as you go out. And for those that call Bridge Church your home, just a reminder, we are not gathering in the morning and really the next morning either. We'll stay in touch via socials. Merry Christmas.